So it seemed to me it's the holiday season. It's a great time. There are all sorts of wonderful new movies. And so why not think about this? Excuse me? So why not think about the movies as a, as a possibility here for talking about art? Yeah, I wish we had more interaction, um, but I. But at this point, what I'm going to do is probably just kind of talk at you for a while, and then see if we can um, go ahead and have some conversation. And I hope the um, the students will be able to participate in that as well. Um, you know, one reason I, I thought about movies here and why we would work with movies is, first of all, movies I think are just fun. I mean, we all like them. Secondly, we work with pop, it's a way to take pop culture seriously, and I think most movies probably blur the line, many movies, not most by any means, but certainly many blur the line between pop culture and, uh, and what we call, I suppose, high culture or more literary culture. So in, they are the intersection between art and commerce, so they're an ideal vehicle to read rhetorically. Um, but the other thing is, movies are a perfect study in audience. So one of the things that I wanted to do today was to talk about how to craft some assignments to get students involved in writing argument, but writing argument from the point of view of audience. This might be an introductory assignment for some students, it might be a review, or it can be something that can turn into more of a research project. So let me tell you that I've got things organized in three ways here. And let me also say that the PowerPoint that we have here is going to be available to everybody who's uh, participating. So I hope you find it useful. And there are some links in it and the like, um, because we're, I'm only looking at partial reviews here. Um, what I'm going to do is analyze an argument a movie review as argument. This is one that's in the second edition of the Language of Composition. It's a famous one on Star Wars. And then I'm going to talk about some examples um, in a kind of an exercise about a particular review. And this one we're going to use True, true Grit, the most recent True Grit. And then after that, I'm going to talk about some follow-up activities for students. So there will be three parts to it, as I said. And it's kind of an I do, we do, and you do approach. Um, so I want to get started right away here. I'm going to be trying to move these through. Um, so this, the first one is, you know, why movie reviews? Um, Visual literacy is everywhere. I know we're all thinking about Common Core now, so it's even more important. But I'm actually going to kind of leap over Common Core and say that for those of you who are teaching AP language, the real issue is getting uh, students ready for college. And visual literacy is such a prominent a part, a prominent part of, their, of their college expectations and the expectations of professors at that level. So I think that's just very important. Also, these movie reviews do have claims. They have evidence. People look at the counter argument. So all the elements of argument are available in a movie review, which is usually a fairly um, uh, a brief document and uh, also fairly accessible. And then also, of course, we, we can do a rhetorical analysis with the movie review. So lots of bangs for your buck here. And as I say, we're going to be talking about them in terms of the three essays that are required by the exam. But my main concern is, is to get kids writing, to get students writing. Um, the other thing is, when we look at movie reviews as argument, what are the elements of argument that are there? You always begin with a clear thesis. It may be thumbs up or thumbs down, sometimes with a qualification. And sometimes it's an analysis that's much more elaborate than just go see it or don't go see it. But ultimately, that's really what a movie review is. It's worthwhile. It's not worthwhile. It's worth your $10 or however much you pay. Or it's not worth your $10 or your time. That's basically why most people read movie reviews. Again, I say most people, we're going to get into some audience issues here that might suggest that not everybody does see things that way. And the other thing is, in order to write a movie review, it's essential to come up with evaluative standards. If this is a good movie, if this is a worthwhile movie, why? Does it take you away from your daily troubles? Does it teach you something? Does it challenge you? Uh, what exactly are the standards? And of course, those are also are going to be tied to audience. And then again, from a very practical start, standard here, a point of view of a teacher, 
those standards can be developed into topic sentences. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about templates for writing movie reviews, but right now I'm just talking about um, argument. Another thing, concrete detail as support. Um, that's very important here. You've got to be able to quote from the movie or cite the movie, not quote from it so much, but cite very specific things about the movie in the same way as you'd ask, um, as students would cite specific um, information in an argument that they were making about any topic, and particularly if they were writing an interpretation of a novel um, or a play. The second, and another characteristic here of argument is that you can use personal anecdotes and responses. You can use your personal experience. How did you feel about the movie? Why did the movie appeal to you? Those kinds of things can be woven into the argument just as they can be woven into any um, argument that one might write for the AP exam or in general. And then as I say again, we have this target audience, which is, uh, which is really key here. Let me see if I can move us forward here. Um, and then one of the things that I do when I work with these movie reviews is that I, I give the um, exercise of the assignment with, with True Grid, and that is education level, age, um, you know, interest level, um, background in various ways. Um, but audience considerations that I'm going to talk about today have to do with what assumptions are you making about the audience? As in anything, do you have to explain who Ingmar Bergman is or, or, or Tarantino? Do you have to explain who the director is? Um, the language, the level of language, is it informal? Is it colloquial? Is it rather scholarly? Um, or is it just at a very elevated level that assumes a, um, a, a pretty high education level? Another issue that's real straightforward here with audience considerations will be length. Um, I was looking up the Bonnie and Clyde uh, review that Pauline Kael did, and that was a review that actually got her into the New Yorker. And uh, it was 7,000 words. I mean, that says something about an audience that would be willing to make their way through a 7,000 word um, uh, movie review. And you'll see it's some of the ones that are blog posts and the like, what their length is. And that very often has to do with audience if you're doing it in sound bites. The evaluative standards, again, is um, a certain audience is simply may want to be entertained. Certainly times when I go to the movies, that's all I want. Other times, you know, my uh, purpose is more to be challenged or to learn something. So the standards will be tied to audience. Allusions, as I said before, certain assumptions you make, if I allude to Bergman, or if I allude to Tarantino, what uh, assumptions am I making about the audience? And the last one might even be the first one, and that is a summary. That how much do I have to tell them about the movie? If the movie is based on a book, if I'm right, looking at a review of the of the movie The Dead by James Joyce, how much do I have to explain the plot to certain audiences? I'd have to explain quite a lot of it. To others, I would just kind of hit the high spots, perhaps reminding people of. What the, what the setting is and, and what the plot involves. But now to the, the teachers here, I, I would say, and I think that's probably most of you, the teachers, summary is not an easy skill. And that's another thing we know that, you know, even when I ask my students to summarize my comments at the end of their papers sometimes, I find that what I thought I said isn't exactly what's coming through. Sometimes that's my fault. Sometimes the failure, we may share the failure of understanding here. But um, in any event, that's, I think that becomes an, an important skill that is built into a movie review. Um, <coughs> pardon me here. Um, you know, I've been reading political cartoons today about the Pope and, and his tweeting. Um, but it's all, always possible to say just, you know, as a kind of pre-activity, write a 140-character tweet about a movie or write a, you know, have a length, um, uh, some length requirement there so that you kind of get students warmed up. Um, now, what I want to start with here but before we look at the uh, Star Wars one, is types of claims. That's, um, if you have the second edition of Language of Comp, you know that we talk about the Toolman analysis. And he talks about 
thesis statements that are claims of fact, claims of value, and claims of policy. What these are claims of value. Um, any kind of review is, is nine times out of ten going to be a claim of value. It's, um, value may lead to policy and other uh, situations, but in this one you're just saying it's good or it's bad, and it's good or it's bad for this group and according to these criteria. So you do have a thesis statement that is a claim of value. Um, and then the um, Duke University site that I'm going to direct you to and that I have some material from in this, um, in this session is one that defines the thesis in these terms, and this is where I really want to start that if you're writing a movie review, your thesis is a central idea that brings together the film's formal and thematic elements. And here's really where, you, um, where, you, where you're getting to the heart of AP language, and in fact, AP literature in some ways, too. But all of those questions on AP language and all the concerns about rhetoric are with how, it's with the how. You're always being asked, you're always analyzing how someone says something contributes to what is being said. What is the writer's craft and how does that craft um, go to um, develop, contribute to a meaning or, a, or an overall point or an overarching point of view. Now, here, of course, the film has thematic elements or meaning, as any literary work would. And then we're looking at some of the formal elements in there. And that might be, again, it depends on how much you know about film, how much your kids know, how much they need to know. Certainly, they're going to be looking at um, visual elements as well as they're going to be listening, what are, what, you know, if their background music is, they're a narrator. Um, and they may know a lot. They may know about camera angles and diegetic and non-diegetic sound, but they don't really have to know that much about formal elements. But that is one of the, that they have to be looking at. They may, they don't need to know a technical vocabulary so much, but they do need to be able to look at how the film is put together, including the people who are the actors who are uh, portraying the characters in the film and then how that all leads together to a uh, theme. But I think that's where you want to look at the, the thesis here. OK. I'm going to start with Star Wars. Again, Lisa, um, if you see people asking questions, um, I keep encouraging you to interrupt me, because otherwise I'm going to just keep going here. The example we used in the second edition is Star Wars. I, I mean. What an iconic film, and everybody knows Star Wars. Um, from people who were standing in line in the 70s <laughs> to uh, see the very first one, to my grandson who has a Star Wars backpack. Um, and, it's, and now, of course, with Disney, we know it's going to go on and on. So I thought, well, if we look at a Star Wars um, review, this is one that everybody can relate to. It's, it's very straightforward. If you have um, the second edition, if you happen to have it with you, it's on page 88. But we have parts of it here. Um, what I'm going to go through is I have put it on the PowerPoint here without annotations. And I'm just going to scroll through that real fast. Because I want to look at the annotations. I'm not going to read all of this to you, but I want to look at a little bit of it just to say, OK, now this would be the model. This is how you would start, or how I would start talking about movie reviews, by looking at somebody who did it and did it well. Of course, Ebert is doing this, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1977. At that time, he was a respected movie reviewer, but certainly not the iconic reviewer that he is now. Um, and of course, uh, he is writing for he's writing for a newspaper at that point. He's not doing he hasn't done the television and, and all of that yet. But let's just get started here and look at how he sets himself up and sets up the um, the thesis statement. Every once in a while, I have what I think of as an out of the body experience at a movie. When the ESP people use a phrase like that, they're referring to the sensation of the mind actually leaving the body and spiriting itself off to China or Peoria or a galaxy far, far away. When I use the phrase, I simply mean that my imagination has forgotten it is actually present in a movie theater and thinks it's up there on the screen. In a serious sense, the events in the movie seem real, and I seem to be a part of them. Star Wars works like that. So. 
again, this is nice because it's a, not a five-paragraph essay, and it is a review that takes two paragraphs, really, to set up its thesis statement. But Star Wars work, works like that is really the thesis statement. Ebert begins by establishing his first criterion, which is whether a film transports him. And he says, it re this one does. This is one where I just forget that I'm not actually part of what's going on on the screen. And, and that's what I want. Then he, he's going to go on here, and the allusions and the references to other films will tell us that he expects his audience to be pretty conversant with um, films, of, contemporary films of that era. Star Wars works like that. My list of other out-of-the-body films is a short and odd one, ranging from the artistry of Bonnie and Clyde or Cries and Whispers to the slick commercialism of Jaws and the brutal strength of Taxi Driver. On what other level, sometimes I'm not at all sure, they engage me so immediately and powerfully that I lose my detachment, my analytical reserve, the movie's happening, and it's happening to me. So again, those two paragraphs do set up that engagement. And he's using his personal experience. He uses first person I. He refers to his own experience. He uses himself kind of as a touchstone. Um, and, and that also tells you that the... This is not going to be a work of scholarship. This is, an, this is a movie review that's in a newspaper. It's a movie review for the sort of common reader, somebody who's going to go to the movies that weekend. It's, it's not the kind of review that you would see in a different sort of um, uh, publication or the different sort of uh, venue. Then he goes on here, and almost in every paragraph, he um, talks a little bit about what he brings up another criterion. What makes the Star Wars experience unique, though, is that it happens on such an innocent and often funny level. It's usually violence that draws me so deeply into a movie, violence ranging from the psychological torment of a Bergman character to the mindless crunch of a shark's jaws. Maybe movies that scare us find the most direct route to our imagination, but there's hardly any violence at all in Star Wars, and even then it's presented as essentially bloodless swashbuckling. Instead, there's entertainment so direct and simple that all of the complications of the modern movie seem to vaporize. So here he is talking about what he means by unique, and he also addresses what he knows is going to be a big draw for a lot of movies, the violence. Um, Star Wars is a fairy tale, a fantasy, a legend, finding its roots in some of our most popular fiction. The golden robot, lion-faced space pilot, and the insecure little computer on wheels must have been suggested by the Tin Man, the Cowardly Lion, and the Scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz. The journey from one end of the galaxy to another is out of countless thousands of space operas. The hardware is from Flash Gordon out of 2001, A Space Odyssey. The chivalry is from Robin Hood. The heroes from Westerns and the villains are a cross between Nazis and sorcerers. Star Wars taps the pulp fantasies buried in our memories, and because it's done so brilliantly, it reactivates old thrills, fears, and exhilaration we thought we'd abandoned when we read our last copy of Amazing Stories. Notice here he's, he's moved to the we, so he's including his audience in the experience, He's already quoted or mentioned, alluded to several movies, and now he's actually going back to The Wizard of Oz, which whether you've ever seen the movie or not, you certainly know the Tin Man, <laughs> the Cowardly Lion, and the Scarecrow. It's kind of part of popular culture. I think the same is probably true for 2001 and um, Robin Hood. If you haven't seen it or read it, you know it. Um, and here he's... Um, He's, he's really establishing common ground. Um, then he goes into a counterargument. When Star Wars came out, and, and the students here might be surprised that those special effects were really extraordinary at the time, but it was 1977. Um, a little different than the Life of Pi that we have now, where special effects become a, um, a, a a kind of focal, focal point of the reviews. Are they the reason you go see it, or do you go see it despite them, or because of them? But here he addresses that issue right away. The movie works so well for several reasons, and they don't all have to do with the spectacular special effects. The effects are good, yes, but great effects have been used in such movies as Silent Running and Logan's Run without selling all-time box office records. I'm sorry, without setting all-time box office records. 
No, I think the key to Star Wars is more basic than that. And here he gets to his principal criterion, and that's the hero's journey, the classic hero's journey. The movie relies on the strength of pure narrative in the most basic storytelling form known to man, the journey. All of the best tales we remember from our childhoods had to do with heroes setting out to travel down roads filled with danger and hoping to find treasure or heroism at the journey's end. In Star Wars, George Lucas takes this simple and powerful framework into outer space, and that's an inspired thing to do because we no longer have maps on Earth that warn, here there be dragons. We can't fall off the edge of the map as Columbus could, and we can't hope to find new continents. The prehistoric monsters are lost tribes ruled by immortal goddesses, not on Earth anyway. But anything is possible in space, and Lucas goes right ahead and shows us very nearly everything. We get involved quickly because the characters are so strongly and simply drawn. They have so many foibles and large, futile hosts. And then Lucas does an interesting thing as he sends his heroes off to cross the universe and do battle with the forces of Darth Vader. He gives us special effects. Yes, ships passing in hyperspace, alien planets, but we also get a wealth of strange living creatures, and Lucas correctly guesses that they'll be more interesting for us than all the intergalactic hardware. Um, you know, again, when I used to teach a world literature class, I, I very often show the um, clip of George, of um, I'm sorry, Joseph Campbell being interviewed by Bill Moyers because Campbell was uh, um, the author of Hero of Thousand Faces and he, he was also a consultant to Lucas on the movie and Campbell just loved the movie. This next scene is one Campbell actually talks about and Ebert now has a separate paragraph where he applies this particular, to several of his criteria to one specific scene. The most fascinating single scene for me was the one set in the Bazaar Saloon. And then he goes and he says, I found myself feeling a combination of admiration and delight. It, the movie had placed me in the presence of really magical movie invention. Here all mixed together were whimsy and fantasy, simple wonderment, and quietly sophisticated storytelling. Then he winds up here. When Stanley Kubrick was making 2001 in the late 60s, he threw everything he had into the special effects. So he's going back to the special effects, and we're going to do some concession and refutation here, depicting outer space. But he finally decided not to show any aliens because they were impossible to visualize, he thought. But they weren't at all, as Star Wars demonstrates. And the movie's delight in the possibilities of alien life forms is at least as much fun as its conflicts between the space cruisers of the Empire and the rebels. And then he ends by reiterating his claim that it's not the technology but the humanity that makes a difference. And perhaps that helps to explain the movie's one weakness. Again, he, he concedes a little fault here, which is that the final assault on the Death Star is allowed to go on too long. Maybe having invested so much money and sweat in his special effects, Lucas couldn't bear to see them trimmed. But the magic of Star Wars is only dramatized by the special effects. The movie's heart is in its endearingly human and non-human people. Um, so what we have here is a model of how a movie review works. You've seen a thesis here. You've seen several criteria. You've seen him break out those criteria into very specific explanations using them um, by referring to the movie and referring to very specific things. So let's take all of that and go to the next step, which is let's look at a couple of different movie reviews and um, and let's and let's talk about audience um, with the Ebert. Star Wars, one of the things I noticed as I was reading it out loud is the vocabulary is pretty simple. It's not, it's not basic. I don't think it's not dull by any means. It's pretty precise. But the sentence structure is pretty sophisticated. You get a number of compound sentences, compound complex sentences. Um, you know, he's able to spin a sentence out for, for a while that suggests an, um, a reading audience that will is, is kind of able to stay with him, who's accustomed to reading um, pretty complex structures. 
So one of the things that's interesting now is because you have movies on, movie reviews online and you have some, some blogs and the like, you're, you really are going to have different um, audiences approached here by the same movie. Now, let me talk a little bit about why I chose True Grid as one for us to look at. Um, I wanted something that had a real broad appeal. Um, you know, LinkedIn, which I adore, and I'm going to talk about LinkedIn later, and I hope everybody has seen it or has the opportunity to see it soon. It is brilliant. Um, I think it's brilliant. Most of the reviewers thought it was brilliant. Um, it's not one that has the same wide appeal by definition. The other thing about True Grit is this is a remake of an earlier movie, a movie with the great icon uh, John Wayne. It's also a movie that is made from a novel. So it has a kind of multi-dimensionality here that makes it an interesting one to look at. Because for one, which audiences care about the remake of the movie and which ones care about the novel? Um, this is a little side note here, but after I was working on this, and or maybe when I was working on it, I don't quite remember, I was um, I got a, an email from the um, uh, about the big read, the NEA's big read, and this year they've added three different novels, and one of them is True Grit by Charles Portis, which is kind of a nice coincidence here, um, and also suggests that this novel, which I believe has pretty much been out of the school system for a while, is making its making its way back in. Um, now, what I'm going to do here is the, all of these are linked, and so you'll certainly some of them will actually appear in full in on the screen, but but not all of them. And so what I want to do is just go through the kinds of things you might look at here. And I really wish we were all together and we could have a discussion of it because, as I say, I'm going to mention a few things that I've seen and that the teachers saw when when I uh, did this in a workshop not too long ago in in Little Rock. And, um, but it'd be better if we could all discover those things together, and I'd love to hear from the students. But we'll do what we can here. Um, this one, I wanted to go back. OK, uh, I just took the, um, the visuals here are the visuals that actually appeared in the movie reviews. So I just want to let you know that. And this was from movie.com. Dave's rating was a four point. And here we go. This is the full review. Okay, so it, this is kind of cool because it says who's in it, the basics, what's the deal, departures, a star is born, what shouldn't happen even if it's as big a hit as the original. That last part falls absolutely flat with me. I think that's trying too hard. It's not funny to me, but I don't think I'm the audience for this one. I also want to tell Dave that he's misspelled Catherine Hepburn's name, but again, I don't think I'm the audience for this particular one. Um, it's set up like an outline. It's short. If we go back to, um, and I don't want to scroll back to it, so let me just look at my slide here, my hard copy of the slide. If we go back to the um, elements of audience, the six things that I, I indicated were what assumptions is the writer making about the audience in terms of knowledge, interest, whatever. What how does the language that the uh, writer use tell us something about audience? The length of the review, the evaluative standards, the allusions he makes and uh, he or she makes, and also the summary of the plot. Well, this one right away tells you what's going on here because it's, I mean, what's the deal? It says, now there's a Coen Brothers movie that you can watch alongside your parents without them complaining that it's too weird. Well, right away here, we know this is written for a younger audience who might be watching with their parents. Um, and again, I think the language here is not real simple, um, despite things like booze-soaked, which actually is a kind of good expression. We have mediating force between two hardened loners. That's pretty precise language. Not highfalutin language, but it's pretty clear. But this is one where, you know, you just want just give me the facts. Um, the departures might be viewed as a kind of counter argument. I, I do like the way he sets it up. He says, you're thinking, look, I saw No Country for Old Men, and all it did was freak me out. Now, hopefully most people who were in high school did not see No Country for Old Men because they think the rating was an R. But 
whatever. We know what it is. We know how violent it was. Um, and we also know it's based on a brilliant novel. But the point is, he's saying, you're thinking, oh, no, I don't want that. And that's a rational response. The Coens are big apologists for random, chaotic unhappiness. But there's a sense of moral order to this movie that will please crowds. No ambivalence about revenge or Old West ethics. There are bad guys, and the heroes go after them, and that's that. Pretty nice. Okay, and then he talks about Jeff Bridges, um, and how, and compares him to John Wayne, and uh, he does make the allusion to Whoopi Goldberg for Ghost or Al Pacino's Scent of a Woman. Um, so there's some sense here that, again that you got people who are looking at this review who like to go to the movies, um, and uh, then he gets into the the young woman Haley Steinfeld who plays um, who plays Maddie. Um, you know. There's no real discussion here about the uh, novel. There's um, there's a discussion about another Coen Brothers movie, but that's really it. So again, how would you characterize the audience here? Um, and it does kind of, um, you know, there's an attempt to be humor, um, but there it's not a very extensive review. It's not one for an audience that. Um, needs to know much more than just up or down. And I think this is it. You know, who's in it, the basics, what's the deal? Now, we go to another one here, Wall Street Journal Review by Joe Morgenstern. And many, many of you probably read the Wall Street Journal. Our, our, my son sends the Wall Street Journal's Joe Morgenstern to me um, very frequently. He reads it online all the time. And um, what we have here, again, that's the picture that went with the review. Um, basically, this is the review. What's on the screen is the whole review. So it's also not a, I mean, think Morgan turns in on Fridays. It's not a long review. But it's considerably different than the one we just read. Um, I'm just going to read a little bit of it here. Um, the patch is on the other eye and the boot is on the other foot in the Coen Brothers remake of True Grit with Jeff Bridges as Rooster Cogburn. i got to tell you, that one, I mean, it's a great opening, is that the patch is on the other eye and the boot is on the other foot. Um, and uh, it's the role that won John Wayne his only Oscar four decades ago, and Mr. Bridges fills it with boozy panache. Joel Cohen and Ethan Cohen fill the film with self-conscious good humor. Hey, it's the Coen brothers and the charmingly old-fashioned locutions of the Charles Portis novel. Um, remaking a cherished movie is not to borrow a fancy phrase from the dialogue, malam in se, wrong in itself, but there are always losses along with changes and gains. The main loss here is inevitably innocence. Maddie Ross, the 14-year-old heroine originally played by Kim Darby, is no longer sweet-faced and freshly scrubbed. She's gimlet-eyed, grimly purposeful, and precocious in a distinctly modern, you're not the boss of me way. And she delivers her lines like a train conductor with too many stations to announce. Very nice writing, muscular writing, clear writing. The only fancy phrase here is malamente, which the way he explains it, that it's from the movie, you know he's being playful right away. But this one opens with a reference to John Wayne, the assumption and, and a reference to the Portis novel. So Morgenstern already has said, OK, there's an audience here that will know these things, or will be expecting the reviewer to make some reference to them. Um, again, there's some language here, I think, that's not uh, that's not, as we go on, that suggests that it's, uh, again, an audience with a little bit different expectation. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing here, um, but I do want to read the, second, the third paragraph. When it comes to life experience, the movie star is no slouch either, and he couches it in zestfully comic terms. I've grown old, this rooster declares, in a growl more gravelly than Popeye's. So he has, but Mr. Bridges hasn't. He's grown for the occasion a beer belly, a bibulous sneer, a lecherous leer, and a broader-than-life comic style that's lovely to watch. Whether Rooster's taking errant pot shots at bottles under the influence of too much whiskey or confronting four adversaries who mean to blast him off his saddle in a showdown that's set up lazily and staged perfunctorily. 
in the end, you have another reference to No Country for Old Men, um, but uh, and, you know, not a real discussion of it. Many of the classic Western exteriors looked washed out in the interior when I saw the film on a big screen and just as much so later on a DVD screener. But his masterful interiors with their darkly sumptuous tones give the movie uh, resonance that goes beyond its galloping action and cantering comedy. Um, so in this one, if you just look at the language here, again, I, I so much want to hear from everybody, but the language itself, panache, fibulous, lecherous, um, sumptuous, uh, there's errant, there's just a vocabulary here that's a little more elevated, but nothing really, and pompous, whatever, nothing all that challenging. This is an essay. This is a four-paragraph essay. It's not one that has the kind of um, subtitles and an, an outline format of the other. Um, so hey, Renee, a, there's a question that came in here. OK. Um, okay. It was from Christopher Lippa. It says, what makes the opening of this review great, rhetorically speaking? How can we help our students to approach writing this way? Well, that's a great question. And I think part of it is that there's, it's playful. And, and you know, movie reviews are movie reviews. I mean, they're not eulogies. They're not. Um, they're not. Uh, you know, um, uh, they're not uh, serious speeches. They are, by definition, playful. And if, if you know, when I, I mean, there is a play on words. The pack is on the other eye, and the boot is on the other foot. You know, not the shoe is on the other foot. I mean, he's being very playful there. Um, and yet, and hey, it's the Cohen brothers. There's a conversational style here. Um, and notice that the, the dashes um, are, are almost parenthetical comments. That's the kind of thing that I tend to do a lot in email. And I know a lot of people take it out of their students' work because they say, you know, be careful here. There should be a formality. But part of it is it's a conversational style that I think is appropriate to email. But I also think it's appropriate here because it's, he's just kind of writing and commenting at the same time. Um, but I think uh, the other thing is, look at some of the descriptions. Kim Darby is no longer sweet-faced and freshly scrubbed. She's gimlet-eyed, grimly purposeful, and precocious in a distinctly modern, you're not the boss of me way. Just look at that language, how clear those descriptions are, and how, how strong they are. Um, she delivers her lines like a train conductor with too many stations to announce. Again, a figure speech, a simile. Um, it is playful. Uh, self-conscious good humor, maybe we have some, maybe self-conscious, but at least it's good humor here. Um, but it's also very precise, very uh, visual uh, vocabulary. Charmingly old-fashioned locution. There, we need, kind of need all three of those. I don't know if I answered your question, but I, and I think, um, again, taking some of those out. The main loss here is innocence. Maddie Ross, uh, originally played, is no longer sweet face. She's grimly purposeful, and she delivers her lines like a train conductor. Again, what are the descriptions adding here? You know, how does this make these characters, how do the words make these characters come to life the way they do on the, on the, um, on the uh, uh, screen? OK, I'm going to move on here. Um, and, and certainly, we can come back to that question. The Mutant Reviewers from Hell I'm using here just because it's fun. And it's a blog. But I love it because it has you know, Justin's rating. Justin, I think we have a link here, so, but I'm not going to click it. Um, so you can go to the whole review. This is not the whole review. This one also is set up like an outline, kind of, but it's just Justin's rating, Justin's review. And so those two paragraphs are from Justin's review, which lasts a little bit longer. Um, and I love it. Varmints, varmints everywhere. And then Justin's review um, is uh, kind of, um, I think, not glib so much as it, it's meant to be lively, but it doesn't, it, it's, on, it's pretty superficial. I can't recall the last time I saw a Western. It's just one of those genres that's been niche ever since its heyday. 
and we know that's misspelled, and no matter how many valiant attempts are made to resurrect it, it never seems to come back in vogue. It's a difficult genre to deal with. It's remarkably non-politically correct. <laughs> we as a society are over our infatuation for cowboys, and it feels much more limited in storytelling possibilities since it is not much other than cliches to mine. And, and that's kind of interesting because what he goes to here is, I think, again, it's a pretty, it's a younger audience, maybe a, not necessarily really young like teenage audience, but it's, it's, a, it's a hip audience that would say, okay, Westerns maybe have outlived their usefulness. I mean, this is not um, something even a 20-something or 30-something would want to, would be as interested in as, as older, one, older viewers. So why would we look at this Western? I myself tend to disagree with all of that, but that's another story. Um, and so here he talks about it, about being politically incorrect, and um, we're over our infatuation for cowboys, although now we're going to have the Lone Ranger and Tonto with Johnny Depp as Tonto, so maybe we'll, we'll, we'll have, there's a, re, a renaissance here of interest. Um, and then it ends with rootin' tootin' fun. That's my final word. Okay, so this one, and this one's very personal. If you look at the rest of it, he says things like, I like how the character of LeBeouf is prickly about his ego. Um, there's a lot of strange encounters. Um, it's a smart film that doesn't apologize. The references here, there's an allusion to Boba Fat. It says um, it's as serious, composed, and determined as Boba Fat. So the reference to Star Wars character, assuming the audience knows that. Um, again, this is, uh, this is a blog post. Um, this one I looked at with the teachers in Little Rock, and we determined we didn't want to read it. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of a funny one, but actually, it's an interesting one from the point of view of audience, because Christopher Orr in The Atlantic. First of all, this is longer. All I have here on the on the um, screen is the beginning, and then the next slide is the end. But this is one where it's very clear. It's not just go see the movie or not. This is a review in a, a magazine that is uh, has very serious political commentary, um, you know, cultural commentary, um, and and literary fiction and, and poetry as well. Um, although I think the Atlantic's not doing fiction so much anymore, but there's still new poems in there. And notice how it takes a much bigger view of things. Joel and Ethan Cohen's True Grid is their second remake of a classic film. The first, The Lady Killers, a noisy reimagining of the understated 1955 Ealing Studios comedy, was by almost any reasonable account the brothers' worst film. True Grid is also arguably the Cohen's second western, following 2007's No Country for Old Men, by general consensus their finest work. It is perhaps fitting, then, that True Grit lies squarely between these two poles of their career, a fine but middling production by the duo's elevated standards. So it's very clear from the beginning here that this isn't just an up or down. This isn't just go see it or not. This is one where what you're really talking about is what is, how does this film fit into the overall um, body of work of the Coen brothers, assuming that the um, that the people who are uh, re that the readers know the Cohen brothers, assuming that they know um, they've seen No Country for No Country for Old Men, that um, that you know that they understand the career of these two uh, gifted directors. So it's a very different kind of review. And I'm just going to say a little quick word about the uh, ending here. Notice um, at the end here it says. Um, the, uh, it's hard to shake the sense that the Coens opted to remake the wrong Western. And, uh, hold on a minute here. I'm going. Wait. Yeah. Let me read you something from the very end here. But the real reason to see the film is the work of the Coens' regular collaborators, cinematographer Roger Deakins and composer Carter Burwell, who supply the visual and auditory landscapes that are True Grit's most notable achievement. Burwell's evocative score is alone, and which consists largely of delicate variations on the hymn, leaning on the everlasting arms, and recalls his magnificent appropriation of Limerick's lamentation in Miller's Crossing, is alone worth the price of admission. This again tells you an audience that I mean, how many 
none of the other people have talked about the cinematographer and the and the and the person who did the musical score. This is at a very different level. But for again, that's part of the argument here for a certain audience. So it's, it's important, I think, to look at that kind of thing. Okay, I'm taking a breath here, and I'm going to I'm moving into a home stretch. So one of the um, I wanted to thank John Golden, who is at the um, I credit him at the end here, and I hope you know the work that John has done on on film, um, some work for NCTE. John actually directed me to this Duke University writing studio, and there's a, a small it's three pages uh, piece on how to write a film review. And um, I think um, Lisa's going to have that available to everybody as a PDF because it isn't, it isn't linking right here. Um, but one of the things I like about this is it is just three pages, and it's very straightforward. Um, it also tells the kids, and you know, this is you know, really intended more for freshman comp, um, not um, possibly for an introduction to film, but it's still a really good approach here suggesting to them that the writing a film review will have five parts. It does not suggest a five-paragraph essay, however, but it does suggest that there will be five parts. The introduction, which is, again, basic information, and we'll have the thesis statement. The plot summary, where you say something briefer or longer about what the plot actually is. The description is interesting here because this is a cinemat cinematic experience. And it says here that you might you will include a detailed description of your particular cinematic experience watching the film. This may include your personal impression of what the film looks, feels, and sounds like. And of course, that reminds us of um, Roger Ebert right there. Um, and then the analysis is how well the film utilizes formal techniques and thematic content. So the analysis is, in many ways, uh, if you look at the classical argument structure, this would be the part where you're actually presenting your argument. You have, you, you know, you're in, yeah, and there probably will be several paragraphs. And then the conclusion evaluation is the one where you will be going, where you'll be saying yes or no to it. You want to see it. You don't want to see it. You should see it if you're interested in this, et cetera. So it's kind of a, agree, disagree, or qualify, or support, challenge, or modify in the language of the exam. But this is a nice way to provide a, um, not just a model, which I think um, Mr. Ebert does, but to also provide a, a kind of a, a template for writing the film review. But it's, it's not a, a formulaic, um, it's not, I don't think it's constraining. Okay, now what I am going to suggest as I wind up here will be possible assignments that you might want to do that would come from this, um, this exercise, this activity. Um, the most obvious one is you might link it to question three on the exam or just in general as an argument. Write a review of a movie, your choice, current or classic, fiction or documentary, for an audience that you anticipate would not choose to see it. And so your job is to persuade them. Now this can be, you know, your grand tell you, you know, persuade your grandmother to go with you to see a movie that you're interested in that she intrinsically that thinks she won't like, or it could be a peer. Um, but it is the, the idea here is that you have perhaps not a uh, hostile audience, but one that would not um, be interested. It's also clearly date movie time, you know. You want to see it, he wants to see that, you want to see this, persuade her to see your, your movie versus the other one. Feel free to write it online using visuals and links. I think that's really important. You'll see in some of the slides the links I just left in. And then, as always, I ask students to write reflections, write a short reflection about the rhetorical strategy used to appeal to this audience. So this is a very immediate one. Um, it's not necessarily for a particular publication. It, it actually is an, an argument. Um, now, the next one, what I tried to do was give you an example of one that you could use for another kind of question that's on the exam. And this is the Daniel Day-Lewis. And I can't actually figure out if that's Lincoln or Daniel Day-Lewis, I swear. Uh, in the movie, I actually got confused. Um, Lewis is so good. But I thought a way to do a close reading of this is if you were 
doing it as a, uh, an exercise before the students did their own writing, you could analyze the structure of the review using the Duke University five-part model. It doesn't really follow um, that model very um, slavishly, as you, as you would think. But it, it actually does reflect the five parts. Again, very much like a classical structure in rhetoric. Uh, you can usually find those five parts in a well-constructed argument, but they might be in different orders and they might have a slightly different form. But then the other assignment is very definitely the, the one that um, would be on the exam. Analyze how the rhetorical choices Scott made or makes are appropriate to his audience. This was published in the New York Times, and it is a rave review. Um, I have a little bit of it here. Renee, a lot of requests are, um, could you put up the last slide with the assignment idea? And mm -hmm. just really quickly, and then someone else asked, um, in terms of teaching, the review, uh, would you go through the reviews and ask students to evaluate the six elements of audience? Um. The answer is yes. And when I, as I say, I, I was uh, doing a workshop in um, Little Rock not too long ago, and we broke up into groups and did it. And it was a much richer discussion, believe me, than my talking it through. But people saw all sorts of interesting things, and they made all sorts of interesting observations about audience. You know, bringing, you know, talk, I, I gave the six elements that I would ask students, direct students' attention to. But people had other things they were bringing out as well. So yes, absolutely. Before they're going to write their own, I would, I would especially if they have the opportunity to write it online, or to take, or to do it in a slightly different format than just a traditional, you know, typed up word document. Um, I definitely, what is, the, who is the audience here, um, and how do you know? And one of the things is, I really appreciate that question also because I gave you the source. I wouldn't do that with students. I would just give them their text. And I wouldn't tell them that this was from movie.com. I wouldn't tell them that this was from, you know, Justin's mutant movie reviews or the New York Times or the New Yorker. I would just say where, you know, what kind of publication or online or print uh, would, where would you, um, can you conclude that these are from based on this information that you have, just the text itself, and what, who is the audience. So that's how I would approach it. But I wouldn't tell them, this is by Joe Morgenstern, it's in the Wall Street Journal, and the Wall Street Journal is a blah, 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 blah. Um, I think it would be much more interesting um, just, to, just to give it to them cold and let them play with it. And there probably are, you know, again, m many more interesting uh, um, sources for reviews. But, uh, but those were, these are the ones that I found with, with the true grip. Lisa, did you say there was another question? No, the only other thing that came in was just someone asking if you could go back to the slide with the close reading analysis mm -hmm. assignments for the Lincoln Review. Yeah, and but. also keep in mind that, the, um, that the, this PowerPoint's yours. I mean, the, it will be sent to participants. I'm right on that, right, Lisa? Yes, absolutely. So yep. anything here will you have, and, and my email address is too, so you can certainly um, ask me questions. Um, this, and I, I just want to go back to the Lincoln one for just a second here, because this one is, I, I'm going to read the introduction, because it takes three paragraphs to get to the introduction. It's something of a paradox that American movies, a great democratic art form, if ever there was one, have not done a very good job of representing American democracy. Make-believe movie presidents are usually square-jawed action heroes, stoical, um, <coughs> excuse me, stoical saloons or ineffectual eggheads. Uh, blander and more generically appealing than their complicated um, uh, real-life counterparts. And here, um, then you go, there are exceptions, and one of them is Spielberg's Splendid Lincoln, which is strictly speaking about a president trying to scare up votes to get a bill passed in Congress. Um, and this is, um, this is, um, you know, then he says it, it, it is, of course, about a lot more, but let's stick to the basics. To say that this is among the finest films ever made about American politics may be to congratulate it for clearing a fairly low bar. Some of the movie's virtues are, at first glance, modest ones, like those of its hero, who is pleased to present himself as a simple backwood lawyer. But here he talks about it being a masterpiece. And this is, I think, just a very interesting review to do a culture reading of. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I did want to just give the slide at the ending here to show that by the end he is actually alluding to other 
films like Birth of a Nation Gone with the Wind. Um, and uh, the ending says, go see this movie, take your children. So whereas the one says, you won't be embarrassed to watch this with your parents, or your parents won't think it's weird, this one says, take your children. So again, telling us something about that. Um, OK, I'm going to quickly go through a synthesis essay here. And that is, select a movie and find at least three reviews representing different, though not necessarily opposing, perspectives. If it's a classic film, you might also research critical scholarly articles. And then I suggest an interview, because I always like to get students out of uh, the, the usual kind of writings. And I think a, a, a video of an interview would be great. And include images, posters, and our trailers used to advertise the film. And then in a synthesis essay like this, what I would do is ask um, write an essay analyzing the different viewpoints and assessments of the film and explain your opinion of the film's success in reaching a specific audience. So you can go back and do Psycho. Um, you could do the Life of Pi that's there right now. You could really go back and do something like Gone with the Wind. And then you also have the kind of research paper here with the synthesis essay. Uh, one suggestion here, Renee, just to chime in. Um, uh, Vernal Pope, I hope I'm saying that name right. So it would be interesting to pair the review with a host with a poster of the movie, so that students uh, write a film review and visual argument for seeing or not seeing the film based on the poster. What thought? Oh, it's a great idea. That's a fabulous idea. And uh, you know, again, the the, um, the trailers I think are you know I always I always love the trailers because you know when I go to the movies and I'm seeing you know something in the quote unquote art movie theater and then I look at <laughs> the previews, and I, I often laugh and say, you know, to my husband, oh my God, they really know their audience, don't they? And they're, you know, these tend to be these really, you know, slow moving, uh, very small movies. But then, you know, when I go see, a, you know, the, the Skyfall, the reviews are very, you know, the previews are very different, so the trailers are, are very different for them. So any, and but the visual posters for them also fantastic, absolutely great idea. I'm just going to end here by suggesting um, that venturing on here, reviews in general have all of the possibilities that we've been talking about today, including the visuals. And so uh, television shows, concerts, plays, a video game, an electronic product, all of those kinds of things. Reviews are arguments. Spend the money on it, spend the time on it. There are many other possibilities here. Um, I've been, you know, I and also talk about audience. I was going to bring in a, a movie, I mean, a review of a video game, but frankly, when I read most of them, I wasn't sure what I was reading because I don't play video games. And so the language itself was such that I would really have to work at it to kind of understand what was going on. So that also reminds you of the assumptions that are being made. And I'm sure, on the other hand, my uh, a, a student who many of our students would know exactly what that was all about. So um, I think that's that's important as well. And then also we could talk about film reviewers as columnists, but I think we're out of time. So I will end here by thanking John Goldson again and hoping that those of you who are uh, participating know his his work reading in the dark and reading in the real world, which are both classroom resources for bringing film in, into the um, into the classroom. And uh, and he and I had talked a little bit about different things as we were as I was working on this. So I, I wanted to thank him. But mainly, I want to thank you all for participating. And I'm going to take it off my desktop now and try to go back and see if I can find some chat questions. I, um, I have one quick one that just came in here, Renee. I want to say thank you again to everyone for joining us, and thank you, Renee, for um, this wonderful webinar. I have one question that came in from Jackie Reef. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, and it might be a good one to end on, but um, it's up to you. The question is, I can't send it. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have a good source for visual elements handouts for students to use in these critiques? Yes, I do. Um, one, John, John's book, Reading in the Dark, is about um, what we call, what I guess we call commercial films. Um, reading in the real world is about documentaries. But also, if you go to that Duke University site, there is another one that is a little bit longer. And boy, it is good for just, um, I'm looking here through my files, um, and I, I really think it's called 
and I can send you, you, you have my email there, so I'll be happy to, to um, email you this. It's called Visual Rhetoric slash Visual Literacy, Writing About Film. And it's only about five pages long, and it really has just the basics. You know, overview, what is visual rhetoric, moving from passive to active viewing, and then it, it has some terms in um, moving from description to analysis, and then tips for analyzing a film, sound, and how to work with sound, and then recommended text, and useful links for, um, for pursuing this. So it is very, very good. So that if you, you know, obviously you're not teaching film courses, but if you don't have a background in film, or even if you do, this is just, I mean, I would give this out to students because it's just a great resource. Um, and it's all part of Duke University's um, writing studio, which is Ideas Online. Perfect. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thanks just, for asking that question. Just to answer two more questions, um, those of you that would like a copy of um, the text that Renee referred to is the language of composition, um, you can email me. Um, my email address I'm going to send in just one minute. Um, but it's lerdley at bedfordstmartins.com. And I'll be sending you all a thank you message tomorrow with the link to the PowerPoint included. So keep your eyes peeled before the end of the day tomorrow for that. Um, and if you have any colleagues who registered and weren't able to make it, we'll be sending that out to them as well. Um, so again, any questions you have, send them my way. My email address was just sent out, and um, Renee's email address is included in the PowerPoint. Yeah, so and if there you. are more questions, if there are more questions, I certainly can answer them now, Lisa. Um, and if, especially if the students have any questions. Um, okay. Otherwise, I would just thank everybody for coming. And I would say I hope you have wonderful holidays and get to go to the movies a lot. <laughs> um, that would be great. Well, thank you, Renee. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Bye-bye. Oh, oh um, Renee, actually, we have one. Are you still on? I'm on. We do have one question that came in just at the last second. I don't know if everyone's still on, but for this person. Um, question is, do you have any recommendations for film-based argument essay prompts? My students are struggling with the concept of incorporating sources. Well, um, that's a really good question. Off the top of my head, now you asked for film-based essay prompts? Film-based argument essay prompts. Okay. Um, well, there's always the book versus the movie. I mean, the Anna Karenina one, I guess, is important right now. Um, and, and in two ways. Not the obvious one. I mean, although the obvious one is one I've given many times, which is to, you know, how does the book differ from the film and, and you know, et cetera. Um, and uh, I've used The Dead by James Joyce, the, the story, and then the, the film, John Houston's film, I, I think are brilliant for that. But I am talking off the top of my head here. But what I could envision right away is, even looking at film reviews of, um, of, Anna, of Anna Karenina, I don't care if they've read the book or not. You could call their attention and say, um, um, compare and contrast two or three reviews in terms of the faithfulness to the book. Or look at these three reviews and discuss how um, each one views the um, filmmaker's um, um, skill with uh, the romance, the idea of it, making it a romantic film. Or, you know, just take out one element like that, isolate one thing and one dimension of it, and then um, ask them to synthesize uh, the, the review comments on that particular element. And that, I think, would meet the objective that you're that you seem to be asking, I, mean, I apologize if I didn't get it right, but the objective which is to get kids to synthesize information, to get them to use text and quote and, you know, develop their own um, analysis of an argument there, but use several sources. And if I didn't answer it, if I didn't really get what you were asking, email me. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. And a big thank you from um, Alexandra Fletcher and her students. Oh, good, good. Well, thank you so much for bringing your students, and I hope they get to go to the movies over the over the holiday. I still want to see Life of Pi. I haven't seen that. I'm interested in that uh, computer-generated tiger, um, and uh, and many many other uh, films. So, um, I mean, we have films about films these days with Alfred Hitchcock. So you have meta films also. 
Anyway, happy holidays to everybody, and um, enjoy the uh, the rest of the uh, of the December. Thank you. Thank for you, Renee. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.